Yes, I mean, on that point, I, uh, I teach millennials, and I'm reminded how old or young I can think or feel. And, uh, but when you look at people who are the next generation and their children, it's that the consequences of what we're talking about today are going to be profound. And this is not uh, grandstanding um, uh, exponential conversations or abundance conversations. It's actually about managing this change rather than uh, getting the future that we want, rather than the one that we're going to get handed to if we're not careful. So I've published a number of books in this area. I'm also doing impact work with the university, Warwick University, Warwick Business School, uh, with uh, public sector, uh, with uh, private sector as well. So I'm actually trying to walk the talk in terms of looking at where AI impact on productivity and uh, consequences of ethics and things like this. I've used as a kind of a base plate, uh, obviously there's the Industry 4.0 of the German government of circa 2010. Uh, I tend to use uh, the World Economic Forum. I quite like some of the work they've been doing recently around the AI and machine learning initiative that you may be watching at the moment. Um, the kind of uh, domain knowledge of that is looking quite interesting at the moment. Um, obviously, I don't need to repeat what this says. Uh, the difference is that we're going into an intelligence um, era, which is where we're starting to codify those. And I think one of the things I was thinking without getting too melodramatic was um, my first book around digital enterprise was I kind of thought about my father who had three jobs. He started off as a cartographer in the, in the 1940s, 50s and uh, that was involving flying out and going and measuring land and taking, making maps, right? And drawing those maps. But now that's completely changed. Uh, the whole definition of how to get maps, we all use the word Google Maps or you know, Bing or whatever, it's just a complete different narrative, which I think is quite, quite profound. He then did military service like most of his generation and then he moved on to becoming a, a draftsman, uh, drawing, uh, technical drawing. And again, all of these things have completely changed within the space of 50 years. And this is a reality when I was trying to ground this in terms of, well, I'm, I can talk about fundamental changes in jobs, but in my own, my own father and mother and people like that, people that you know, your own life experiences will tell you that technology just changed things. But the question is, what's going to happen next? Now, this particular diagram here I put up on the internet, it's from my, my third book. Um, I wish I had a dollar or a euro for every time somebody retweeted this because <laughs> this has been retweeted like hundreds and hundreds of times and people seem to like this diagram um, because it kind of speaks kind of four truths about people think it's going to happen but we're not sure but it could happen. But really what I want to do is just talk about those in summary over the next uh, sort of few minutes with you um, and related to some of the research work that I'm doing at the moment both in the UK uh, I also spend time over in the Bay Area. I'm very interested in looking at Silicon Valley and elsewhere because I think that's where most of the cutting edge research does seem to be cutting its ground at the moment, but clearly there's work being going on in Europe and uh, China and uh, Japan and elsewhere and South Korea. And um, really, we, we talk about four things. One is obviously the reduction in work from humans' point of view, um, creation of new work in terms of being able to do new skills, um, the augmentation of our experiences, much like my father and all of us, we all augment ourselves with, with knowledge now and that's going to ex accelerate. But the one I think that really is quite interesting is the one at the top, superhuman intelligence. And that's not a kind of sci-fi thing, I am very grounded in terms of reality, this is not a, a sci-fi discussion. Um, there are performance issues now about machines that are way beyond what any human can do. And really the two questions are what will happen when that starts to happen, because you want that. If you want a car to stop in time, and it should have had the sensors working correctly in the, in the time of the decision space, then it should have saved the pedestrian. And that was the whole point of it being automated in the first place. But likewise, we can get great insights from these machines that can see far more data, that have eyes in the back of their heads, metaphorically speaking, that none of us can do this. My favorite phrase is none of us can get 10 Hossein bolts in a room and run the 100 meters in one second. It doesn't work like that. But these machines can. And this is the reality that we kind of start to build for ourselves or our children will be faced with this reality. One thing I think just to state um, my own personal view and also the evidence I'm seeing now is what I call task-based AI or specialized AI in terms of the goal 
and the utility function, all of this is starting to be codified. So obviously the human with five senses, machines have other senses, they've got ultrasound, they can see infrared things that humans can't do. But all these things are going to be starting to be codified as services. You're seeing this already with Microsoft. I mean, I like the slide with the, the five, uh, what they call FANG, or the five uh, big cloud providers. But there is also a lot of work going on in small startups as well. Don't just think it's just a big, big it's just a dinner table for the, for the big, big clouds. It's actually everybody can still be designing algorithms and becoming over the top services on top of that. But the key point I want to make here is that really that we can start to go from left to right and you can look at designing your processes and replacing all of the sort of human senses with machines and that's happening already. One of my favorite ones at the moment, and it's not an endorsement by me of the product, uh, Microsoft is just check out their Microsoft Build um, solution. It's very interesting in terms of the videos, you can watch them. They're using sight, they're using speech recognition, they're using all this kind of background capability in deep learning. And then when you're walking around a hospital or even around this building, if you're trying to find where the toilet was and things like this, forgive me, I, I had to figure it out myself um, quickly because I was speaking. Um, all these things can be augmented by the place that we're in. It's called edge computing and augmented reality at the edge, but with intelligence as well now. And this is not fiction. This is not science fiction, sorry. This is reality. The one at the bottom there is an engineer talking into his phone, <coughs> translating into work instructions that is then triggering a colleague that has been identified by uh, facial recognition. Now, this doesn't need to be played through in terms of analyzing a lot of jobs. Going back to my father or indeed all of your life experiences, um, whether you're a blue collar or white collar worker, to use that, that phrase, lots of the tasks that you do, and they've already seen that in the previous presentation, um, the percentage points of the amount of work that you do will start to be codified and done by machines. It's just a matter of humans, ourselves, designing those at the moment. It's not being designed by, by machines directly yet. But these are just examples. I don't need to go through these, but nobody's safe is the point I'm making. So if you move on to creating new jobs, I think the work that we're doing at Warwick and elsewhere is this idea that, well, what do you do about it? You can either kind of let it wash over you and kind of change the process and adapt to it. But what we're kind of seeing, and one of the things we'd like to see the, you know, the European Commission and other people working on this area, is really trying to start to focus on building um, new types of work, either through using this technology along the bottom, which is what they call work productivity innovation, so we can actually become augmented people um, without getting into the cybernetic links and all this sort of stuff. But thinking about how that augments your work and creates new rich picture experiences. I've done this with engineers. When you tell them this can make you more employable, smarter, then they like it. And when the unions get it, they kind of then like it also because it can protect the health and safety of people better because there's people, what, there's machines watching over you to kind of monitor what's going on in theory. But the thing that's really interesting is thing which hopefully Europe will be able to step up to the plate and work in a coordinated fashion. And I've written about this several times and I'm thinking, what did I write? But anyway, let's not go there for the moment. But the idea of creating new capabilities, new products, new experiences with AI, the top part of the equation in terms of driving superhuman performance, creating competitive advantage of nations, of, of, of processes, is really where this thing can take us. And really, as we've seen with some of the grand challenges in the earlier presentations, there are existential threats or even just local issues around people, resources and things where AI is going to be needed to make, a, make, a, make that optimal for our, for our futures. There's loads of examples there and I, I don't need to express those in detail. Augmentation is already going on. I think the key thing that I tend to talk about, it, uh, AI is done by itself. You just get some AI, yeah, just get some AI and it will think for itself and it'll do stuff. Well, no, it doesn't work like that, actually. What you have to do is you have to, as we've seen earlier, you've got to connect it with IoT, information at, at on demand. You've got to be able to use augmented reality and virtual reality to be able to express that in a way that we can consume it because we can't, we don't have a brain interface yet <laughs> with AI. We have to have a forum or a mechanism in which to use it. And apart from Pokemon Go, we are kind of starting to use this now, but it's still not quite there, but it needs to be brought together. AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, internet mm -hmm. of things, and blockchain, of course, as well as another technology, and creating those digital twins. 
One of the most ex startling things I had recently over in San Francisco, where I saw someone bring out a mobile phone with a mobile app and said, you want to see my brain? I said, what do you mean, see your brain? Well, I've got an MRI scan. He, he showed me his brain had been an MRI scan. He was flicking through the layers. I said, well, what do you want to do that for? Well, I can then connect that to my medical record. And I can start to have a diagnostic in my pocket. But you don't go to the hospital to get treated. You can carry it with you. So this completely inverts the model of how precision medicine is going to work. There are many other examples of many other industries. This takes me on to the sort of last few points I want to make about. Superhuman intelligence will happen anyway. It's already there. And these are just three examples. Generative design, designing skeletal super uh, architectures that no human can do. They just physically can't do it. Trading on the stock exchange, using micro trading and things like that is just something that's been around for several years. And then obviously the famous one with the Rubik's Cube being sold in 0 0.67 of a second. The fastest human is 4.46 seconds. There is no human on the planet, as I'm aware, can do a Rubik's Cube in 0 0.67 of a second. Well, we want this. They built that not to prove that machines were smarter or AlphaGo is smarter than us. It was because it was designed to be able to respond quicker to emergencies and emergency stop situations. They wanted to show a machine could function better. So really our challenge is really, the point I want to make is, how do we design these spaces to leverage this kind of capability for the good? So the question in my mind is, why hasn't this happened yet? And we've already had that point earlier. Why can't we do this now? Well, in summary, without building on this, is we go in, we look at augmenting a, a service for either chatbot or we're using image recognition and so on and so forth. We then find that, well, some of this stuff has then replaced some of the work involved. So I don't need some people to do this because I've got a machine can do it for me. And then maybe, though, I can then start to create new types of work from that. And then when I'm creating new types of work, well, perhaps I might be able to generate even something that beyond the human performance. And then I can drive that cycle of improvement. And that's the one we want, by the way. But there's also the possibility that it removes people out of the equation altogether. So the question we've got to ask ourselves, and one of the things that if you look at the, the current research that's going on at the moment is self-learning. I was glad that someone, I think the um, speaker by Amelia, was talking about using virtual environments to train robots. What they're doing now is they're starting to use compute into data, and this is starting to be the, the modus operandi. You don't have to collect all this training data, you can self-generate it, and then it's a matter of using different models to manipulate that to a realistic level. So this is going to happen anyway. And the question in my mind is, are we going to pick the, the red pill or the blue pill? Are we going to go path number five or path number six? That's the choice we've got to make. And this is already happening. Some work I'm doing with my, my day job in other areas with Enzyme, which is just a utility consulting company, is that we're starting to build, at task level, augmented systems and moving all through those six steps. We're looking at replacing some work. We're looking at augmenting some work. And we're creating some super insight around how energy, smart meters and energy consumption are being managed. People in this room will already be building some of this right now. This is not new to you. So the question is, and um, I believe my next speakers and speakers after me will be talking about this in more detail from a legal point of view, and I'd, I'd rather leave it to the legal profession to explain this because this is really complicated. But I've certainly heard this phrase called jurisprudence, and that's quite a, an interesting phrase because the question is, where is the jurisdiction in, in AI? How does this actually get defined? Because this is moving, it's difficult, it's opaque, it's difficult to follow. And there's quite a lot of innovation that needs to happen in the legal space. So the key question, without getting too melodramatic, is that this is not a safe space. A colleague, uh, Professor Tim Watson uh, at Warwick uh, Manufacturing Group for Cybersecurity, said, we enjoy the freedoms in the physical world. If we want to enjoy those freedoms in the virtual world, we've got to make it the same. You can't just assume that because it's safe, we're very lucky to be in a beautiful place, a city like Brussels. But in the, real, in the virtual world, it's not the same as the, as the beautiful plants and buildings that we see. And if you follow just quickly the generation of cyber attacks, it went from a denial of service, then it went into data breaches and all that sort of thing. We're now getting this nasty stuff called ransomware, which is kind of semi-AI related. It's intelligent, switches on and off based on algorithms. 
And then we start getting the big stuff that's being in the news lately, which you don't need me to, to repeat about fake news and all this sort of stuff. And then the fire sale, which is, uh, is, is, is serious. And so the, the point I'm making here is it's going to affect the whole infrastructure. And the way we need to construct this is we've got to think about how we're going to secure the infrastructure to enable that when AI comes in anyway, how are we actually going to make sure it's safe? We talk about uh, AI as kind of like bioweapons and treating AI as something that needs to be developed in a safe space, and that is another area that I believe some of you will be familiar with, whether you should let it out, and whether it should be contained, and things like that. And so the last sort of key point on my last couple of slides are, where we are now is we're building task-based, specialized-based AI, and this is happening now. This is happening definitely in the Bay Area where I spend a lot of time. This is already gonna happen that most of the functionality of processes will be replaced by task-based AI. The question is whether that's choreographed, and I like to, an earlier speaker talking about you can't order a pizza if you're just speaking to your phone. It's a, it's a great point well made, because it's not connected yet. But that's actually gonna happen next. What happens next is that that whole I don't want to use the pizza delivery. It doesn't sound very, uh, very sexy and very it's interesting, but I'm sure it's really important if you want pizza. But this idea of being able to automate that entire industry is really what's going to happen next. And what's holding us back is the infrastructure. We talk about 5G, which I think is a slight distraction a lot of the time when you actually try to understand what's going on there. But certainly the infrastructure is not there yet, but it will be there. And part of the job of the European Commission is to show some development around that and to develop platforms that will allow that kind of industry transformation, but in a good way. So the last couple of things, just to wrap up is, um, I like this phrase from uh, Professor uh, uh, Joanna Bryson in Bath University in the UK, who says, we're not ethically obliged to build AI. We don't have to do it, but we are ethically obliged if we do. The other thing, which uh, another uh, professor who actually did, was one of the founding uh, experts in um, swarm technology, said that we need to understand how knowledge is coded in machines as well as humans. We have to understand what does it mean to be human and mean to be able to code that. And then my last one, which um, uh, if you allow me to really share this thought with you, is that certainly Stephen Hawkins did say two things to us. Clearly, he was one of the, uh, the, groups, uh, the groups of people who were saying that AI is a threat and was really raising that as an issue. But he did also say intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, and that is onus on us to be able to adapt to this change as well. And I think that's the important thing, the key takeaway to all of us here, is our ability to adapt, because it's not just our generation, because I'm, I've got another 10 years or whatever, but it's the next generation who are going to be directly affected by this. But I do believe that we can build the right future. I will leave it at that. Thank you.